funny when you look at the uh, two NFL uh, franchises in, well, I was going to say northern Florida. One of them is more central Florida. The other is more east coast Florida, but northern certainly. Um, maybe no two different franchises in what's going on right now between the Bucks and the Jags. And what city is just nestled right in between those two uh, lovely towns there in the Sunshine State? Well, it's the home of our friend Connor O'Gara, who, of course, is the senior national columnist at Saturday Down South, right there in, well, do they call it O-Town, uh, Connor? Am I giving Orlando an, in, an incorrect nickname? Oh, they call it that. I mean, not really in public. That's more of like, a, you know, in, in, in the comfort of your own home, you can say that down here. You don't really go shouting out O-Town down here, but, yeah, I mean, we do sort of claim um, whichever NFL team is more relevant. Like, I was here back in 2017 when the Jags were, you know, uh, in the AFC Championship and, that was super interesting. I go to the grocery store yesterday, and I'm seeing more Bucks gear than I have my entire life. So we just go whatever way the wind blows down here in Orlando. Well, good, because you, you get a chance to you know root for a top overall pick next season. Then you get a chance to root for somebody in the Super Bowl in a couple of weeks, too. Um, you know, Before we get into, into the college football stuff right now, I still think the best play in the NFC Championship game was Leonard Fournette's uh, spinning touchdown, leaping, diving touchdown. What an amazing run by the former LSU Tiger. Uh, he, uh, it's not like he was the finishing touch for that Bucks team, but man, he's, he's added a lot for them. Which is surprising because I, I kind of thought he was done at, at various points in his career and even this season. I mean, there were this, there were times this season when he was a healthy scratch for them. But Fournette is somebody who, obviously, everybody at LSU knows how talented he was, and they saw something really, really special in 2015. But it, to me, this was more about you know getting the right pieces around him, and he's in a very favorable situation, obviously, now, where you have so many talents on the outside that you have to account for that, I mean, I think he's finally in a situation where he doesn't feel like it's you know loaded boxes constantly and you know, he's a guy that was going to succeed, I think, with good surroundings. Didn't necessarily have that during his entire time at Jacksonville. But at Tampa, man, I mean, goodness. What what situation would you want to be if you're running back other than what the Bucks have right now? Maybe even the Chiefs, though. They, they deviate from the running game so much that I was thinking about that with Clyde Edwards-Lair, who really didn't get a chance to get going very much. I know he scored in the AC Championship, but... You know, I just think that being able to play in that Bucks backfield right now, um, that'd, be, that'd be a lot of fun. I would sign up for that. Uh, all right, let's get into uh, let's get into Tennessee here because uh, you know nobody's had their entire athletic department blown up uh, this week. So we'll we'll talk about the one that happened last week. And I guess you 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 almost would have had like a front row seat for what Danny White uh, built at UCF there in Orlando for these past uh, few years. He's known for making great hires. It was a really quick uh, decision by the Tennessee uh, powers that be, and it looks like they're uh, kind of circling around three head coaches according to uh the report that you guys found on football scoop so um things are kind of coming together for tennessee i guess as far as the searches are concerned it's still going to take a while to rebuild that program yeah i mean i i would say that with a grain of salt because this is still a job that nobody has accepted and just because you're vetting candidates doesn't mean that you're actually in talks with them to uh, have a legitimate can- chance of, of leaving their current jobs to take on a situation that, let's be honest, it's brutal. Why would you want to sign up for that Tennessee head coaching job right now when you don't know what the NCAA punishment is going to be for major, you know, major violations, level one violations we're talking about here when you are going to have to rebuild? I mean, even Tennessee at full strength was three and seven in an all SEC season this past year in which they lost six games by double digits. I mean, this is not a program that is just the right personnel hire away from being all of a sudden good in year two. They're losing players left and right. And the fact that they're facing punishment from the NCAA, they're going to face punishment from the NCAA, doesn't exactly suggest that uh, Tennessee is a place where you can just go collect a $5 million paycheck and, and be on your way. When you have to also consider like, that Jeremy Pruitt is currently in this lawsuit for his buyout. So even if you sign up for that hefty buyout, what's to say that Tennessee won't try and wiggle its way out of it after year three? So I just think it's a really unattractive job. And 
yeah, it's cool that Tennessee's vetting those candidates, Sonny Dykes, P.J. Fleck, and, and then Tony Elliott at Clemson. But, you know, ultimately, they're not signing up for this yet, and I'll be surprised if one of those three decides to go down that road. Well, then it's a giant risk, whoever it is that, t- that comes in. And, I, you know, I, 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 it feels almost like uh, like a Matt Luke situation at Ole Miss. Yep. You know, somebody that is is already connected to the program somehow, whether he played there or whatever, uh, you know, and knows that he's just going to be dealing with a lot of crap for a couple of years and that he might not get more than those two years to coach there anyway. I think Kevin Steele is going to be Tennessee's head coach in 2021. I think what's likely to happen, because keep in mind we're a week out from the National Signing Day, if you want to still call it that, but what I think is going to continue to happen is Tennessee is going to make it seem like it is in talks with some of these big-time coaching candidates. I think that it makes a lot of sense from there and to want to do that and to make it look like, hey, you know, recruit that we're trying to – get to commit to next week, we're going to hire somebody big. Just trust us. If they can kind of keep those headlines for like a week, it would make sense. But I don't see them doing what they did back in 2017, which was realize that their top four or five candidates weren't able to work for one reason or another, and then, you know, settle for someone like Jeremy Pruitt, which that's what Tennessee did. And to repeat that same mistake during a time like now, it just doesn't make a lot of sense. And for the reasons I mentioned earlier, I just don't think it's really attractive for anyone on their short list to want to leave and go there. So I think that we're living in a very different time when group of five coaches are being paid much better than they were in the previous regime. And for all those who think P.J. Fleck would get poached, I mean, this is a program that hasn't hired a head coach with power five experience at the head coaching level since Johnny Majors in 1977. All right, let's, let's stop pretending like Tennessee is just you know, about to go swing for the fences and go land some home run higher. It's just not going to happen. So I'm reluctant, you know, to really believe anything other than, yes, they're they're vetting this person, but that doesn't mean that they're in close talks to actually bring that person on board. Connor O'Gara from Saturday Down South joining us here on Halftime. Connor, let's get your thoughts a little bit on some Arkansas football. You had a great pace on Saturday Down South, as you always do. Talking about the top 10 uh, uh, SEC offensive names you need to know for 2021. And right off the bat, you went with Arkansas's Myron Cunningham. What is it about Myron Cunningham that you think the SEC fans, the faithful, needs to be on the lookout for him next season? Yeah, I mean, we're, we're talking about somebody who is super, super experienced, right? I mean, this is somebody who you know, is entering year six at Arkansas, which is kind of a weird thing to, to, to say in this current context, but because of the year that we just had, you know, there are guys like Myron Cunningham who were able to take advantage of that. And I tend to think that the longer you stay around Sam Pittman, if you're an offensive lineman, that's going to bode really, really well for you. This is somebody who had to gain weight to be able to play in Sam Pittman's system, and now that he's up around 325 pounds, I just think that he really – has a lot of potential. I mean, he was super, super durable this past year, 705 snaps. I mean, one of two SEC players who didn't miss an entire off, uh, who didn't miss an offensive snap in the entire season. And I just think that with a normal offseason like this, it makes sense that he would project really, really well. Uh, another year in that system with Kendall Bryles and someone who, you know, he's not going to get any of that preseason all SEC type of buzz, but I think Arkansas fans came to know how reliable he was this past year. Pro Football Focus had some really high marks for him, number seven among SEC tackles and pass blocking. So I just tend to think that somebody like him is going to be a great kind of uh, proof of concept for Sam Pittman's system. When you look at what's returning next season, but with all the seniors that are coming back, you got Grant Morgan leading the way on defense coming back next season. A lot of your offensive talents coming back, you are going to have to replace Felipe Franks. In your, though, in your estimation, Connor, what's priority number one for Sam Pittman and this coaching staff heading into the offseason and getting ready for 2021? I think priority number one is stability, which you've already kind of accomplished that. I mean, barring something unforeseen with Barry Odom and LSU or something like that, which we don't think is going to happen, it looks like you're going to actually have more stability than you could have ever hoped for. So I think now that you've gotten that taken out of the way, we got to see the development stage, right? We got to see, we got to see Arkansas improve the line of scrimmage. We got to see them be able to last throughout an entire season and not kind of fade down the stretch like they did. And I think that, I mean, it's cliche, but that stuff starts now. And I think that we're going to see a lot of, of this, you know, this, this development as we sort of get into fall camp and you're going to hear, guys like Barry Odom and Kendall Bryles, 
praising the development that they've seen now that these guys have had a normal off season. So I like, that's a really boring answer, but I, I think that's the key to Arkansas actually making this jump to get to a bowl game via six wins and not via a pandemic season. But I think that's perfectly realistic. And as long as they can avoid some of these catastrophic injuries, obviously losing somebody like Grant Morgan would be brutal. KJ Jefferson, you would hate to see that, but if they can avoid that, I think that all, all signs point to that happening by the time that fall camp rolls around. It's got a long way to go before we figure that out, but I think you're 100% right. Last thing before I throw it back over to Phil, we had the uh, AFC and NFC championships yesterday. And prior to you getting on, we were just talking about, we thought that the 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 legacy, the kind of like Tom Brady was etched in stone as far as like what his what his resume would do. And Connor, everything changed. I mean, heck, it took another team to a Super Bowl, a team that has the worst winning percentage in several, several years in the NFL. With no offseason, no nothing, how and Tom Brady takes him to the Super Bowl. It's just incredible to see. And I think, does this, in your mind, change the view of Tom Brady and just adds more to what's already an incredible legacy? I think I wrote three years ago that the discussion about Tom Brady being the best football player of all time needs to end. So, yeah, I'm, I'm going to agree with you on that. That I just don't know what, what else you can ask for. Like, 10 Super Bowls? 10 Super Bowls? I mean, the, the fact that there's that stat going around about how Tom Brady has a higher percentage of making it to a Super Bowl as opposed to Steph Curry hitting a three. Like that, that's what we're talking about here. I, I mean, you just like we've run out of words for Tom Brady in the last like five years. I think it, it, we we sort of reached that point where we're like, all right, you know, exclamation point, he's going to be able to go out on top. And if, if you're not in the Tom Brady is ridiculous and this is just absurd what he's doing camp yet, I, I don't know what else is really left for there for that to ever happen i don't think that can happen you're just always going to have that mindset if you're anti tom brady but yeah i mean he's the best football player of all time and if he wins the super bowl with the bucks i mean the conversation for best athlete of all time it just has to be up there can i just close on uh, on a thought on uh, nick saban hiring bill o'brien as his offensive coordinator it's always nice that when you lose your broils award-winning oc to the University of Texas, that you can go get a guy who won a few division championships in the NFL, just like that, who had a, a successful mini run bringing Penn State back from oblivion. Um, this is a, this is this is a great hire for Nick Saban. What makes Bill O'Brien different from Sark? Well, Bill O'Brien made Christian Hackenberg look like a competent quarterback. So that that's like, I know Steve Sarkeesian has the whole like, oh yeah, I love the two most prolific offenses in Alabama history thing under his, under his belt. But Bill O'Brien being able to coach up Christian Hackenberg, I mean, you got to tip your cap to the guy because that is no small feat. But, you know, I, I think that right now we shouldn't question Clay hire when it comes to the offensive coordinators. I mean, even if you look at Brian Dable, that, that hire didn't necessarily proved to be a fit with Jalen Hurts and what he wanted to do, but Brian Dable is now like apparently on the verge of becoming an NFL head coach. And I, I just think that Bill O'Brien is someone who, when given the chance to be able to focus just on offense, he's not having to do all the GM stuff that he was having to do with the Texans and all that, I think it'll be a lot easier for him. I, I think he's going to have a ton of success there, and I think that Steve Sarkeesian's at a bar that's really, really, really hard to be able to live up to, but I think Bill O'Brien really bodes well for what Alabama's going to try and do, and they're going to try and basically just pick up where they left off, which there are very few programs in college football, I can say that, but yeah, with Bill, Bill O'Brien on board, I, I don't really see Alabama falling off offensively, at least not in the way that some were predicting Alabama to back when Sarkeesian took over a couple years ago. Yeah, no doubt. Appreciate your time as always, Connor. Thanks for hopping on with us as you usually do on a Monday. Uh, we'll talk next week. Sounds good. Appreciate it, guys. All right, give him a follow at CJ O'Gara on Twitter, SaturdayDownSouth.com. Great place for uh, all your SEC sports needs, not just football. They get into basketball and baseball, too, which, yes, is uh, two weeks away. Don't forget, if you own a business that needs more security or needs more curb appeal, the number to the Fenchman, 479-782-3936. Call the Fenchman, and they'll come over for a quick no-obligations quote. And nobody does it any better than the Fenchman. Things like gates, controlled access card readers, other custom installations. Fenchman's been doing it for over 40 years. 479-782-3936 for the Fenchman, a division of Quantum Property Services.